Hello and welcome to Financial Markets Microstructure. This is lecture number six. Last time around, we talked about two somewhat related things. Firstly, we discussed the determinants of market depth. And we saw that they are not that much different from determinants of market liquidity. Namely, adverse selection and inventory risk work in almost exactly the same way as they did, but uh, inventory costs and um, dealer's market power uh, may have different impacts depending on uh, depending on the trade size. We in looked at Kyle model in greater detail to see how adverse selection works with uh, with trades of non-trivial quantity and how adverse selection can generate can generate price impact equations. And finally, we also looked at the empirical estimation of determinants of the spread, and we saw that order costs are actually the most significant contributor to the to the illiquidity partly because it is a catch-all term however we also saw that both adverse selection and inventory risk are quite significant contributions contributors to market illiquidity today we will shift our focus to order driven markets and i will not give a extensive introduction, but rather just dive into it. So all the models of financial markets that we have seen so far dealt with dealer markets, so markets in which there is a central intermediary who quotes prices and serves as a proxy for all transactions. So Gloston-Milgram model, the Kyle model, the Stoll model, they were all uh, exploring dealer markets. And there is a reason for this. All of these papers were written quite a long time ago. Gloster Milgram and uh, Kyle models, apologies for that, I meant to press another thing. Uh, Gloster Milgram and Kyle models were written in 1985, and Stoll model was written even before that. And if you take a look at financial markets, at how they looked in those times, then a picture similar to this would come to mind. Financial markets in the 70s and 80s were quite a hectic time, but almost all of the trading, or a lot of the trading, was dealt on the physical trading floor. And the best way to organize trading on the physical trading floor is to organize it through an intermediary who would be responsible for all trades in a given stock, so as to not fragment the market within this huge trading floor and uh, facilitate the exchange of uh, information, to facilitate the visibility of the quotes for any given uh, stock or any given asset more generally. So most markets in 1985 were physical markets. And as you almost surely know, this has changed quite drastically. And if you look at an average financial market today, it will look something like this. All trading, or almost all of the trading, happens online, or digitally, or electronically, where orders can be matched together and routed using automatic electronic systems. So there is much less of a need for a dedicated intermediary who would organize the trade in a certain stock around them. This shift in technology gave rise to order-driven markets, so markets in which there is no dedicated dealer necessarily, but rather all market participants serve as traders. They submit their orders to a limit order book, and those would be the limit orders, as you probably know, while some other traders would submit market orders and uh, take liquidity from that limit order book without any kind of central strategic intermediary who would provide quotes and uh, set up this limit order book. So how, what is the difference between these two markets? How do order-driven markets or limit order book markets, as I will also call them, how do these markets differ from the dealer markets that we have explored before now? If you look at 
the point of view of traders who are submitting market orders, then there is not that much of a difference. In either market, you are looking at a schedule of prices, depending on your order size, and you optimize given that. But it does not matter that much to you whether this limit order book was composed by individual traders or it is a price schedule composed by a separate dealer. So there is not that much difference for market traders. On the other hand, traders who submit limit orders in the order driven markets effectively act like dealers. They take on the role of dealers in providing market liquidity. In particular, it is these traders that deal in limit, order, uh, in limit orders that accept the burden of the adverse selection risk. So if you submit a limit order to a market and it just hang, hangs out there for quite some time, then it might be picked off when an unfavorable information for you arrives. So somebody sees a profitable opportunity to trade against your stale quote. But there is also a novel aspect of, um, of risk, which is faced by limit traders, but less so by dealers. In particular, if you look at dealers, they trade in the market because they have to. It is their job to provide quotes and buy or sell to anyone who is willing to buy or sell. Limit traders, however, are on the market because they actually want to trade, presumably, because they want to acquire an asset or because they want to get rid of an asset. So they have desire for a transaction. However, by submitting limit orders, they face a risk that this trade which they are willing to do, which they are in the market to do, will not be executed. So limit traders are subject to non-execution risk. And this non-execution risk is an extreme form of the risk of delay, which you can see as a you as a trader not being able to know when your limit order will be executed. So it might be just a few seconds or even milliseconds or your limit order can hang in the limit order book for minutes or hours or even days depending on market liquidity. So limit traders are subject to these two new kinds of risk, delay risk and non-execution risk. And you can see these as substitutes for dealers' inventory risk. But again, from a bird's eye view, limit traders provide liquidity to, to the market in the same way that the dealers provided liquidity to, to the market in the dealers' market. Another important aspect of uh, order driven markets is that there is now no exogenous separation between liquidity providers and demanders. So in dealer-driven markets, you always had a dealer on the one side of the market providing liquidity and all traders being on the other side of the market, demanding this liquidity via market orders. Now in order-driven markets, any trader can choose between a market order or a limit order. In the former case, they would take liquidity from the market. In the second case, they would provide liquidity to the market. So this is a new choice that is not present in dealer markets. What is this choice motivated by? We just said that limit traders face a non-execution risk on their trades, on their orders, and a delay risk as well. While these risks are absent from market orders, so why would you tolerate this risk and submit a limit order instead of a market order? Well, the answer is simple. You can get a better price on your transaction if you use a limit order instead of a market order. And we can see it on a very similar, I would not even dare call this graph, but on this very simple scheme. So. If you have just two prices on the market, an ask price and a bid price, 
and imagine that you are a trader who wants to buy the asset. If you submit a market order to buy the asset, you will pay the ask price to the existing limit orders to transact at the best limit order to sell available in the limit order book. However, if you accept the possibility, the, uh, the non-execution risk or the delay risk, and submit a limit order to buy instead, and it gets executed, then you will trade at the bid price B. So you, you will get to buy the asset at price B instead of price A, which is obviously lower. And it works the other way around for uh, sell orders, where you, with the limit order to sell, you will transact at the ask price A, which is above the uh, bid price B that you would get if you submitted a market order to sell. So this is a non-trivial choice, that between limit and market orders. Of, uh, of interest, is this self-balancing property of markets in which this choice is present? In particular, suppose that mar uh, traders arriving to the market can choose between limit and market orders. If your limit order book is thin, so there is not much liquidity, the spreads are large, the depth is low, then using a market order is very expensive, is very costly. While the possible price saving from using a limit order is significant. And furthermore, from the fact that the book is thin, due to this, due to this fact, you face a lower non-execution risk on a limit order. So you do not have much competition from other limit orders. So the, the chance that your order gets to execute is actually quite high if limit order book is thin. Therefore, the benefit to submitting a limit order is quite significant, while the cost of doing so is uh, not so high. So if limit order book is thin, then the traders have reasons to submit limit orders instead of market orders, and thus replenish the limit order book. And vice versa, if the limit order book is very saturated, then the gain from submitting a limit order is not that large, while the cost of doing so is high because you have a lot of competition from other limit orders. So when the limit order book is thick, traders will be more incentivized to submit market orders, thus taking liquidity from the market. Now what we will do today is we will explore a simple model of order-driven markets. And this will be one of the two models that uh, we will explore. And this model by Gloston from 1994 will deal with static analysis of the order-driven markets. In particular, this will explore um, how the prices are formed, how limit traders set their prices and are these prices efficient and as a result we will be able to see how the depth of the limit order book is determined while next week we will be looking at the dynamic choice between taking and making liquidity So, and as I said, this is a model by Gloston from 1994, and this is likely one of the first models of order-driven markets. So you can see it uh, actually appeared much, almost a decade after the Gloston-Milgram and Kyle models, and it reflects to some extent the transition from physical floors with uh, dealer-driven markets to electronic trading with order-driven markets. The model looks as follows. As usual, we have a single asset in the market that has some fundamental value V, which is unknown to most traders, but all traders agree what the distribution of this fundamental value V is, and we will denote this distribution as uh, G of V. Now, there are competitive limit traders 
that compose a limit order book. So before we had competitive dealers, now we will have competitive limit traders. And as I said for today, we will fix the roles of traders. So we will have limit traders separate from market traders. So some traders will only be restricted to submitting limit orders and some others will be restricted to submitting market orders, but they do not have this choice explicitly. Now, uh, com in contrast to what we had before, where we imagined that we had one dealer, one representative dealer who was implicitly competing uh, with other dealers, for the Gloston model it will prove more illustrative to explicitly think of a lot of limit traders who are each submitting a limit order for one unit of the asset. Formally this is exactly the same thing, but it will be more intuitive to see things this way. So without loss we will just look at one side of the market in our investigation of Gloston Milgram model. So we will look at the ask side of the market with the limit orders to sell and market orders to buy. But the analysis of the other side is completely symmetrical, so we are not really missing much by focusing on the one side. Now, once this limit order book is, is composed, there will be some price schedule realized by this limit order book. In particular, the, the market traders will face some price schedule and they will realize that prices vary with the volume Q. So we will let this P prime of Q denote the marginal price for the Q's asset that you want to buy. In particular, you can buy the first asset, the first unit of the asset at price P prime of 1. If you want to buy 2, you will have to pay P prime of 1 for the first asset and P prime of 2 for the second unit of the asset, and so on. So this is the marginal price of every next unit. And you can see this as uh, exactly trading against many small limit orders to sell. So you arrive at the market, you see the limit order book, you see many different small limit orders to sell, one unit of the asset, and you just walk up this book. So you pick off these orders in the order of um, decreasing appeal. If, since you're a buyer, decreasing appeal means increasing price. So first you trade at the lowest price, then you trade at the second lowest price, and so on. And if your order is of size Q, your final trade will be cleared at the limit price of P prime of Q, or the marginal price. With this mechanism, the entire, the, the total amount that you will have to pay to buy volume Q is given by this P of Q. And in the continuous version, where units are infinitesimally small and all limit traders are infinitesimally small and they trade in infinitesimally small amounts, it's given by this integral. So you integrate over. The, this marginal price p prime of q for all trades that you take. So for all values of this q tilde between zero and q. In discrete case, you just sum up these limit prices p prime one, p prime two, p prime three, and so on. So this integral is the continuous analog of this. And as you can see from this representation, it turns out that our marginal price p prime of q is exactly what it is. It is the derivative, the first derivative of the total amount that you pay for the order of size q. So p prime of q is the price that you pay to increase your q by one the additional price from one more unit of the asset. If you want, you can also obviously compute the average price at which your trade will be executed. We'll call this small p of q, and we will not be using it 
that much. And you can obviously obtain it by just dividing the total payment, large P of Q, by the trade size Q. On the other side of the market, we have the market traders. In this model, we will be assuming that there is one market trader per period, and we'll just label this trader I, although this index does not matter for anything. And this is uh, similar to what we had in Gloucester Milgram or Kyle. What is different is how we will model this market trader's decisions. In particular, we will assume that there is this theta I of Q, which is trader I's marginal rate of substitution between money and assets. Or a similar way to say it is that theta I of Q is the marginal valuation of the trader for Q's unit of the asset. So given this theta I and what we already, the way we already introduced our limit traders, we can say that this market trader will determine their buy order size Q from this equation by equating their marginal valuation for another unit of the asset and the marginal price for one more unit of the asset. Now to elaborate on that, here's a very simple graph that you have seen many times. So we can represent this as a well-known demand and supply uh, graphs, curves. So on this graph you have price of an asset, the quantity traded. The demand curve is given by the trader's marginal willingness to pay for the qth asset, while the supply curve is given by uh, the limit order book supply, or the supply generated by uh, limit, or limit traders limit orders. And the idea is that in this case the equilibrium or the optimal trading amount by the uh, trader, by the market trader, will be given by exactly this. You can see this problem as uh, just doing an iterative problem. The trader first asks themselves do I want to buy one unit of the asset, q equal to 1? The marginal price that they have to pay for this is p prime of 1, so it's pretty low, while the marginal valuation of getting the first unit is pretty high. Then for the second, third, fourth, and fifth unit, it is pretty much the same. The marginal price keeps increasing for every next unit as we have already discussed, while the marginal valuation probably keeps decreasing. Now it's not 100% obvious why that would happen in our financial context. In particular, if, in particular, if, um, if the market trader is risk neutral, then they should value each unit of the asset in the same way. So they should have this constant valuation theta i of q, and we typically assume so far that this valuation is given by just uh, the trader's expectation of the fundamental value v. However, more generally you can think that the trader has these other concerns such as portfolio concerns, maybe liquidity concerns, current or future, so larger trades require larger access to capital and more capital, att attracting more capital to get to buy more assets is costlier. So the effective will willingness to pay for uh, further units is decreasing. But long story short, this is the equation for determining the trade size Q for the market trader right. Once again, it's equating the marginal willingness to pay and the marginal price of the further assets, of the further units of the asset. Now note that in this case, in this model, we have not explicitly 
described how this state i of q relates with the fundamental value of the asset v. We just said that this is the trader's valuation, but we did not say is it information based, is it uh, risk based, liquidity based, or something else. And we will pretty much not take a hard stand on this, but we will just say that if the incoming traders are informed to some extent, or with some probability, then for now we'll say it's reasonable to suppose that for a given order size Q, higher valuation for the trade of that size is indicative or suggestive of the higher asset value V. This was true in all models that we've seen so far, except for except for the stall model, where a higher willingness to pay for a given unit of the asset was dictated by the current inventory of the dealer. But this is the scope of our information-based approach uh, for the time being. And what this gives us is the fact that this conditional expectation, namely the expectation of the fundamental value V, conditional on the marginal value on the marginal valuation of the trader for the qth unit of the asset uh, equal to some fixed value. We will say that this conditional expectation is increasing in this state, in the marginal valuation. So if we knew the trader's marginal valuation, then higher marginal valuation would be suggestive of V. So this is exactly what we just said. Limit traders are once again competitive and they post limit orders. We said how we model this. Namely, we said that we will use this marginal price schedule P prime of Q, but we did not really say how this P prime of Q is determined by the limit traders. Now, when does our limit trader who submitted some price for the qth unit of the asset. When does this trader get to trade? When is this order executed? This order is only executed, it's only relevant if the trader places a market order, here the market trader is meant of course, if the market trader places a market order of Q or larger. So if uh, market trader puts in an order of size Q. This order is traded at this price. If market trader puts in the order of size Q plus 1, then this is also traded. And the limit trader cannot discriminate between these two cases. But the limit trader can discriminate or, between these two cases and the case when market trader submits order Q minus 1 because then the limit trader does not get to trade. So in the end, this is the main distinction between limit traders in this model and the dealer in Gloss and Milgram and Kyle models. Back there, the dealer knew exactly how much the market uh, order size how big exactly the market uh, order is, how much exactly a market trader is willing to trade. While in this case, any single limit trader does not have access to full information. So if limit trader who is cute in the limit order book gets to execute his order, then he knows that the whole order size was at, cle was at least Q but he does not know how much larger than Q it was. Therefore, since limit traders are competitive and uh, due to that must get zero profits, and uh, as usual they value the asset at the expected value, at its expected fundamental value, 
we will get that this price that the limit trader sets for the Q's unit of the asset in the limit order book will be given by the conditional expectation of the fundamental value V, conditional on the fact that the order size of it is at least Q, meaning that the marginal valuation for the Q asset of the market trader is above this price. But again, the difference is this inequality sign. While for the dealer, this would be the equality sign, just like here. So the price that the dealer would set for Q units of the asset will be given by this conditional expectation. While the, and this price will be valid for all Q units in that order. In our case, with uh, many different limit traders, the price of the Qth asset, of the last asset in this trade, will be given by this expression, which is strictly larger. So the marginal price of the last asset will be larger in the order-driven market than the average price that would have been quoted by the dealer for that exact amount. But the marginal price for the first asset may or may not be lower than this. So market makers or the limit traders always profit on the sale of the last units. This price that they charge for the last unit in the trade will be always be above the marginal the expected fundamental va value V conditional on this trade. Simply because these market dealers once uh, mar sorry, not market dealers. Simply because these limit traders once again cannot ex ante condition their price on being relevant only in this case, but they also have to quote a price which yields them zero profit on average between this case and another case when uh, order size Q is very large because news about V of the market trader are very optimistic. Now this also leads to the fact that when the realized trades are small, the market maker will always profit, or the limit trader will always profit. Simply because this inequality will hold for all units traded. And this will be due to the fact that this market valuation will be very close to the ex ante market expectation because the news are allegedly very weak when the trade size is very small. Now, even with continuous prices, this inequality, once again, so we're just talking a lot about this inequality, generates us the inside spread between bid and ask prices as the order size goes to zero. And this is something that we have not really gotten before. So we did not have it in stall model, we did not have it in Kyle model, where the price schedules were continuous at zero. And the price that you got for a very small buy order was very, very close that you got for a very, very small sell order. In this case, in this model, there is a wedge between the two. There is a discontinuity at zero. And this is exa exactly due to this conditioning. So the buy order, the limit trader who is willing to sell the asset, so the limit trader on the ask side, for the, say, the first uh, unit of the asset, so the one with the best quote, conditions on the fact that the market trader is willing to buy the asset. While the same limit trader or a similar limit trader who provides the best bid quote, so on the other side of the market, conditions on the opposite event, on the fact that the market trader is willing to sell the asset. And these two condition events are very different. So they both rule out half of all possible worlds, half of all possible contingencies, but they rule out the opposite halves. And 
and they end up in generating very different prices that generate zero profits. So the first limit uh, buy order will generate you the price part in that. So let me try to say that again. The best ask quote conditions on the fact that the market trader is willing to buy, but it cannot condition on how much the market trader is willing to buy. And vice versa, the best bid quote conditions on the fact that the market trader is willing to sell, but it cannot condition on how much the market trader is willing to sell. And this is what creates the inside spread. So the difference between the best ask and the best bid prices. The final observation is that due to the fact that the marginal price of the last asset is always above the, margin, uh, the market valuation, after a trade of any size Q, the new expected asset value will be below the marginal price of Q. So this marginal price of the last trade is not ex post efficient. It does not properly reflect the market valuation of the asset or the new market valuation of the asset conditional on the trade. It always overstates this market valuation for on the ask side and understates it on the bid side. And the explanation is just well, more of the same, but I think I've uh, stayed on the slide for long enough. So this was the very broad intuition for the Gloston model. In general, this model above outlines the basic differences between the order-driven markets, or the limit order book markets, and the dealer markets. You see that the adverse selection affects prices differently in the two scenarios, in the two worlds. And given the same distribution, given the same behavior of traders who use market orders, the price schedules generated by the limit order book will be very different depending on whether they are generated by the limit order traders or by a singular dealer. And this is due to the fact that they can extract different information from from observing their trades, from observing the separate from from, from observing any given transaction taking place. Now the model that we just looked at neglects the discreteness of prices, which is a very salient empirical issue. In particular, in the real world markets, prices are quite often discrete and they must lie at a tick, so at a particular price grid. You cannot uh, trade at buy dollars or buy over two orders. In particular, at New York Stock Exchange, until 1997, you could only quote prices in increments of one eighth of a dollar. At least for stocks with uh, prices over one dollar. So you could not even raise or drop the price or undercut the price by one or two cents. You had to undercut the competition's price by one eighth of a dollar, so by twelve and a half cents. In 1997, this was reduced to one sixteenth of a dollar, so by half. But uh, only three years later, it was further reduced down to one cent, which is actually still a quite a sizable tick size, quite sizable. Yes, tick size. Now, as we will now see in the model with discrete prices, the priority between different limit orders does actually come into play with um, due to this discreteness of prices. This is exactly due to the fact that no marginal undercutting is allowed. So you cannot undercut by you cannot undercut your competitor's price by an infinitesimally small amount. But rather you have to commit to quite a significant discount, such as one cent most recently. Now the model is mostly the same. So we have still one single asset with fundamental value V distributed according to some G. We have some market order Q 
and we will now explicitly introduce some distribution of market over size. We'll say there is some f of q. And once again, we will just focus on the ask side of the book because everything is completely symmetric on the bit side. So we'll only consider q's greater than zero. The innovation is now we have this discrete price grid, which is given by A's. Here, A1 is the lowest tick price above mu, so where mu is the ex ante market valuation, the expectation of V, the unconditional expectation of V. So A1 is the lowest price that can be quoted that is above this mu. A2 is the second lowest, and so on. And so the difference between these A's, the distance between the pairs of closest A's, is the tick size. You can assume that this tick size is constant. It does not really matter for our analysis. Now we will assume that limit orders are prioritized by time. So those orders that, I pro that are posted first are also the first to be executed within the same price. So here we are talking about limit orders at the same tick. But obviously still limit orders with the lower prices are executed before the limit orders with higher prices. So price priority takes precedence. Another innovation that uh, we cut from the continuous model for simplicity is this display cost. So we will assume that there is cost C that every limit trader has to pay when they submit their limit order to the market. And notably, this cost is paid regardless of whether the order actually executes. Now, to introduce some notation, let small yk denote the amount that is supplied at price ak. So, in our, once again, simple mental model, with many small limit uh, traders who each submit an order for one unit of the asset. YK is the number of limit traders who submitted their orders at price AK. And the capital YK is the total amount, the cumulative volume or depth, that you can get as a market trader at prices no higher than AK. So this is the sum of YJs. Uh, for all j's between 1 and k. Now, for sake of notation, it is worth noting that this equality holds. Now, once again, we just imposed some distribution on q's. We did not say how q's connect with v's. So what do, uh, do trade sizes tell us about the fundamental value of the asset? But maintaining our assumption that larger orders are generally suggestive of higher valuations, so there is this monotonicity in place, uh, this equality holds. So this right side is what we had before. Uh, this was the expected price, the expected market valuation conditional on the market trader's marginal valuation of the Qth unit of the asset being above price AK. And so this should be equal to AK in our equilibrium. But we will restate this expectation as a conditional expectation of V, given the fact that the order size Q is larger than this cumulative depth YK. So note that these two events convey exactly the same information. Order size is greater than yk if and only if the valuation, the marginal valuation for the yk, I guess, unit of the asset is greater than ak. Now, how does the competition work here? So we have told, we have uh, mentioned that there is price precedence now, so and there is price precedence, and it is followed by time precedence as the tiebreaker between limit orders submitted at the same price. We have not introduced the timing of the model explicitly, but you should think that 
all of these infinitesimal limit traders are ordered in some random way. So they form a queue and one after another they submit their limit orders. So every limit trader, whenever their turn comes, they submit a limit order given what they already observe in the limit order book and given what they expect the future traders will also submit. Now in this scheme, limit orders are supplied at each tick until the last order ends, earns zero profit. So it will be only the last, the marginal order at every price level that should get zero profit. But notably the the next trader, the next limit trader who gets to, to choose their limit order, they will no longer find it worthy to submit another limit order at this same price. Right? Because their marginal profit from doing so will be negative. It will be below this fair expected value. The, the expected value of the asset to them. So they will jump on to the next tick. We can illustrate this process using this graph that we have already seen. Here this old black line P prime of Q represented the conditional expectation of V given the fact that trade size Q is larger than any given amount than this Q in the argument. And this was uh, the price that the limit tra trader was willing to set for the qth unit of the asset. So this is the price that generates zero profit. Now with discrete prices we have this process going as following. So say the guy with the first unit would be willing to accept a price as low as this p prime of 1. But the lowest price that he can actually set that is weakly above this level is this a1. So he will set the price a1 and he will also get the expected profit equal to the distance between the two. Now there can be of course lower prices so a0 which is also different by from a1 by a tick but this price will necessarily be lower than this p prime of 1. So the limit uh, trader would not be willing to submit their order at this price because then they would get an expected loss and it's better to do nothing than to submit a uh, unprofitable limit order. So the first trader uh, submits an order at price A1. For the second unit the limit trader once again is willing to accept the price as low as P prime of 2 but again the lowest that they have, the lowest price that they have access to, which is no less than p prime of two, is a one. For the third trader, you can see that a one is already unprofitable, so a one is below p prime of three. So this third limit trader is not willing to set price a one because they would face an expected loss. So they switch to price a two. And so in the end, once we also push the size of the limit traders and their order sizes to zero, we will get that this supply curve in the discrete case will be given by this step function drawn with blue lines. In particular, you will see that the first trader at any given price, at any given tick, typically gets expected positive profit, while the last trader at any given price gets zero expected profit. And that's what we meant when we said that only the last, only the marginal orders at any given 
price level at any given tick, earn zero profit, while inframarginal orders can earn positive profit. The zero profit condition for this marginal order can be written like this. It looks a little more complicated, but this is purely due to the order fee C. So before we only had this equality, sorry, we only had the condition that this expression inside the brackets should be equal to zero. Now, given the display cost C, it must be that this expected profit of the limit trader times the probability that their order executes should be exactly equal to the display cost C. So in this model, limit traders get some expected profit from their trading, but all of this expected profit is fully consumed by the display cost C. And so if you rearrange this expression just a little bit, you can arrive to this expression, which connects the price level AK with the cumulative depth that should be established at that price level YK. And as you can see, it consists of two terms. Namely, there is always an adverse selection term to the price, and there is also the execution risk component. And this execution risk component will actually be increasing the further we go into the book. Because the higher is the price you set on your limit order to sell, the lower is the probability that you get to execute. So the larger is the probability that your display cost is going to be wasted. And the smaller this probability is, the larger should be the expected profit that you should get conditional on trade. Now the graph that I just showed you completely ignored the display cost C. But you can incorporate that in the... You can incorporate display cost C in that graph pretty easily by adding by adding this term to our old uh, P prime of Q supply curve. Now this expression connects, as I said, AK and YK. So it tells you what should the price be given any depth level, cumulative depth level. While in reality, we need to invert this expression. And we have fixed ticks AK. And from this expression, we can determine what the cumulative depth will be at each of those ticks. Let us look at some examples. First, let us look at a simple binary example akin to what we had in the Gloston Milgram model. So, here let uh, small g be the marginal distribution of large g, so the probability density function, or the, just the probability distribution function of the fundamental value v. And we'll just say that uh, fundamental v value v is binary, it's either high or low with probability 50 50. And so, if it's high, it's above the exanti market valuation mu by this positive shock sigma. And if V is low, then it's the same exanti market valuation mu, but this shock comes with a negative sign. And now we will micro micro model the traders. So we will again take this ghost to Milgrammy world where with probability pi our trader is in front, so he's a speculator. We'll denote them as S. And the speculator knows the fundamental value V. With probability 1 minus pi, our trader will be a noise trader whose trades are uncorrelated with the fundamental value V. And we will say that this noise trader buys or sells with equal probability. And then, conditional on the order direction, they can use a large or a small order. And they mix between the two with equal probabilities as well. So we will denote the large order size by QL and the small order size by QS. In the end, we get that noise trader uses 
one of the four trades with equal probabilities, one fourth. So it's either a small buy, large buy, small sell, or a large sell. For this example, we will assume that the display cost is uh, zero. It's not present in the model. And we will uh, look at the model with continuous prices, so not discrete prices. Now we will be looking for an equilibrium which is actually discrete. So even though limit uh, traders would be able to set prices um, at all levels, they will only be setting prices at one of the two levels. In particular, we will have two prices, A1 and A2. And we will begin by assuming that they are between VL and VH, and we will end up confirming that this is the case. Such that at price A1, the depth is equal to QS, and at the higher price A2, the residual depth is given by the difference between QL and QS. So that cumulative depth at price A2 is given by QL. In simple language, it means that if you are willing to trade to buy QS units of the assets, you have to pay A1, while if you want to buy QL units of the asset, then you have to pay A1 for the first QS units, and then you have to pay A2 for all the remaining units. Now, why is this a reasonable equilibrium to look at? We know that a noise trader will always only trade in one of these two amounts, so either QS or QL. This means that the speculator will also only trade in one of these two units, because otherwise, if speculator submits a market order of any different size, then limit traders will instantaneously realize that, well, this order comes from a speculator. So they will not be able to adjust prices exposed. We have talked a lot about this. But this is to say that this cannot happen in equilibrium. So if in equilibrium, speculator did submit order sizes, orders of sizes different from QS to QL, then this inference should have been made by limit traders in equilibrium, which we cannot have. Therefore, speculator will only use one of these two units, QS or QL. And in particular, given this restriction, in particular that VH is greater than A1 and A2, the speculator will, when the fundamental value is high, the speculator will want to buy as much as they can, since the asset is worth VH, and the... Uh, Pay A1 for some units, A2 for others. So speculator will buy as much as they can, which is QL. Once again, if they try to buy any more, then in equilibrium they will only get a fair price for that, which is BH. So they will not get any profit on, on these further units. So the speculator will buy QL units when the state is high, and will not buy any units when the state is low because then they will obviously want to sell. But we are only looking at the buy side, so we do not care about that. What this means is that in equilibrium, our prices should satisfy these two equations. So our price A1 should be equal with competitive limit traders to the expected valuation, to the expected fundamental value V, conditional on the fact that the order size Q is at least QS. This is given by this expression. And the price A2 is given by the expected fundamental value V, conditional on the fact that the order size Q is at least QL, which, given what we just said, uh, is equivalent to just conditioning on Q being equal to QL, because it is never larger. Now, to give you just a little more detail into how these two are 
derived. Here are the exact expressions. So let's look at A1, for example. It's the expectation of V conditional on Q being greater than QS. And let us split this into two events, depending on whether the market trader is informed or not. The market trader is, or no, let me say this here, the ex-ante probability of, uh, of there being an uninformed market trader who is willing to buy at least QS is given by what? So with probability 1 minus pi, the trader is uninformed. With probability 1 fourth, conditional on being uninformed, they want to trade QS. And with probability 1 four, they want to trade QL. They want to buy QS and QL respectively. And in this case, the fundamental value of the asset V is given by mu. Because noise traders, trades, are not informative. On the other hand, the second event is that the trader is informed and wants to buy at least QS, which happens with probability pi, trader being informed, and then with probability one half, the state is high, so the trader wants to buy. So this is the exante probability of the market trader being willing to buy and being informed. The expected V in this case is given by mu plus sigma. We know that the informed trade, if the informed trader is willing to buy, then V is high. And finally, in the denominators of the two fractions, are the sums of these two exante probabilities to turn them into conditional probabilities. A2 is derived in the exact same way. So it's the expectation of the fundamental value V conditional on Q being equal to QL, as I just said. And compared to what we had in A1, only one event is ruled out, which is the event when the market trader is uninformed and wants to buy QS. But this event will still be hit if uh, the uninformed trader is willing to buy QL or the informed trader is willing to buy. So we have these probabilities here. We adjust the probabilities accordingly in the denominators, because once again, these conditional probabilities should sum up to one. And the v's in the two cases are still the same. So if you simplify these two expressions, you will get exactly what I have here on the slide. Now, once we have this, it is straightforward to check that these a1 and a2 are indeed between VL and VH, therefore this is an equilibrium. Now let me stop in just a bit more detail, because I have not told you what an equilibrium here is. So let us just try to back this out from what we did. What is an equilibrium in this model? Equilibrium consists of strategies of all players. And in this model we have two active players, limit traders or and market traders. I guess not two active players, but two groups of active players, because we said that there may be many competitive limit traders. Okay, so for the limit traders, what they do is they set the prices, basically A1 and A2. And the equilibrium condition for these prices are these zero profit conditions. On the other hand, the market traders decide how to trade, so which orders to submit. And we have discussed that this is the optimal trading strategy as long as this condition holds. And as we can see from these expressions, this condition does indeed hold given the zero profit condition. So in the end, the limit traders uh, said prices that gives them zero profit and the informed traders trade optimally therefore this is an equilibrium so this is what is contained in this thus now to discuss this example so what what did we do here as i told you this is not a really a great example for discreteness because we do not set the ticks 
exogenously, uh, but rather they arise endogenously in equilibrium, even though limit traders can set any price they want for any unit of the asset. So the example that this discreteness arises is due to the discreteness of noise trader's strategy. So we have only two possible order levels and effectively two possible groups of events. Therefore only two price levels are really necessary here. And this is a very artificial assumption, so this is not a realistic model, but it allows us to see how prices are formed in equilibrium. In particular, it told us how adverse selection manifests itself in uh, order driven markets. Namely, the price increases in order size. So it's the same conclusion that we had in Kyle model, but the source of this effect is now different. In Kyle model, the price impact was positive due to stronger information of the speculator, of the informed trader. In this model, the price impact is positive due to the strategy of the uninformed traders. So noise or traders, so sorry, the probability of the trader being informed increases here with order size. The conditional probability of the trader being informed is much higher after QL than it is after QS. And this is what drives that first selection. So this is uh, slightly different from what we had in the Kyle model, where it's not about these relative probabilities, but rather about the information that that the fact that the informed trader submitted this given order size what this information told us about V. Let us take a quick look at another example. It will be more interesting in the sense that there will be no discreteness coming artificially like this. Namely, we will assume that market orders, um, market order size Q, are distributed according to an exponential distribution. Namely, their CDF, small f of Q, is given by this expression, theta over 2 times the exponent of minus uh, theta times the absolute value of Q. But this richness will come at a cost. Namely, to maintain simplicity, we will assume the price impact equation. So we will assume how this conditional expectation looks like, how, namely what information does any given trade size x convey about the fundamental value v. And we'll just say that this price impact equation is linear, it's given by mu plus lambda x, or some constant price impact factor lambda, which measures the informativeness of order flow. Now this assumption embodies both the assumption on the distribution of V and the distribution of Q conditional on V. So it's both the, it characterizes the exante uncertainty about the fundamental value of the asset and it imposes some assumption on how market traders react to their private information about V and how many of them are informed and how well they are informed and so on. So this is a pretty significant order to cut, but once again we are more interested in how the limit order book is formed given the behavior of the market traders. So at this point we are just taking this market trader's behavior as fixed and we do this kind of reduced form analysis. Now how does this look like? We need to derive this conditional expectation, just going back here for a second. Basically to derive the price we need to find this conditional expectation of V, conditional on the fact that Q is not equal to X but Q is greater than any given value. Because once again that's the kind of information that limit traders can condition their behavior on. 
They only know that their order is hit, but they do not know how much further into the limit order book the market trader got. To derive this conditional expectation, we begin with obtaining this conditional PDF. F of Q, conditional on the fact that order size Q is greater than some cumulative depth YK. Once again, we will only be looking at the marginal order at any given price level. So keeping track of these uh, cumulative depths YK is really sufficient. Now this conditional PDF is given by, by Bayes' rule. The unconditional PDF of F of Q divided by the probability uh, that Q is greater than YK. And the Bayes' rule in this case looks particularly simple because obviously the, the probability of random variable taking value Q is included in the event that random variable takes value that is larger than YK. I guess the notation here is not exactly perfect because here Q in the numerator Q denotes the realization of the random variable and then in the denominator it denotes Q as a random variable but not its realization. So, but if we rewrite this probability, we can uh, write it as an integral of f of q with respect to q from yk to infinity. And then we can substitute the exact form of f of q, because we know how it looks for exponential distribution. We just assumed it explicitly. And if we plug it in, and if we do all the calculations, we will arrive to this final expression for the conditional PDF of uh, trade sizes Q. And given that, we will be able to compute the expected value that we're looking for. Namely, the expected fundamental value V conditional on the trade size being at least YK is given by this mu plus lambda times the expected value of Q. And this comes from our assumption on the uh, price impact equation. So we assume, basically, that this expectation looks like this. The first line caps by assumption. But all further lines are just algebraic manipulations. So we rewrite this expectation more explicitly as an integral which uses the conditional PDF that we have just found. So we can plug this conditional PDF in to obtain this third line. And then the probably hardest part is using the integration by part on this integral, which will give us this next expression. Simplifying this expression will bring us all the way eventually down to the bottom to here. And what do you see is that yes, we can probably continue. Oh sorry, let me stay here for a second. So what do you see here is that this if you, this expected fundamental value v conditional on this um, order size being greater than yk, which is exactly the price that the limit trader would set for yk unit of the asset, is given by this expression, which resembles the linear price impact equations that we had before, except for this term 1 over theta. The highlighter does not really work well with fractions. And this factor is what will give us the inside spread. So without it, we have the pure linear price impact equation that we had in the Kyle model. But here we have this term, while for bid prices on the other side of the limit order book, it will come with a negative sign. So this is what will generate our discontinuity 
at yk equal to zero. And now we can plug in everything that we found, namely this expected fundamental value, the condition on the trader um, on the trader's limit order being executed, and the probability of this execution. And we will then be able to find the connection between the equation connecting tick AK and the cumulative depth at the tick YK, depending on the model parameters, including the display cost C. So as I've told you, without the display cost C, we only have this linear price impact equation with an intercept. While well, display cost C also adds this another expression. And finally, once again, if we're talking about a market with predetermined ticks, then we actually need to invert this expression. So we need to find yk for any given tick ak. And that would be the question of our investigation. But this this expression is not quite easy to invert, so we will we we just write it this way. And this is pretty much it for today. So we had our first look into order-driven markets using Gloston's model, and we saw that effectively limit traders take up the same role fill and fill the shoes of dealers. So they fulfill the same role of liquidity provision in markets, but the difference is they face different informational environments, which leads them to act differently. So the price schedule that they generate does differ from what dealer would have generated uh, if they were in the market instead. And this results in slightly different market outcomes and different conclusions re regarding price efficiency and price dynamics. In the next lecture, lecture 7, we will be continuing this exploration of forward driven markets. We will begin by exploring some issues of market design, namely we will see how tick size and different priority rules affect market outcomes. And what we will see is that these are all double-edged swords, so they benefit some market participants at the cost of others. And we will conclude with dynamic analysis. We will consider parlor model in which traders can choose between limits and market orders. One thing I should note here, just as a reminder, is that this lecture is the last one that is a dedicated YouTube video. And everything starting from next class is a live stream recording. Therefore, it is even less focused, more mumbly, and uh, there is more interaction with chat, with students. And uh, a lot of my explanations are directed at students directly rather than you, my dear YouTube viewer. That said, I hope you will enjoy the rest of the course regardless. And for, uh, for this class, here are a few questions that you can use as practice to make sure uh, that you follow this class well. As, uh, as usual, the textbook has some exercises you can do. Exercise 1, as an example, is the one that we will consider it one of the future exercise classes. And here are two more of an open-ended questions that are not ex explicitly present in the textbook. I will leave you to read them. And and the one last thing I should note is that the next lecture, the next video in the playlist is that of an exercise class. And this is exercise class 3. And you should not be worried by this, because this is indeed the first recorded exercise class, and I will not be re-recording exercise classes 1 and 2, because there is not that much value in it, as I feel. However, the remaining three exercise classes were recorded, so they are on YouTube, and uh, they are there for your viewing pleasure. 
in these exercise classes, we basically solve through the these exercises and some of the problem sets uh, that I assign to the students. With this, I will sign off. Goodbye.